but I don't really care about the death of stars, which a lot of people at HITS do. I'm more on this, how stars form. Um, yes, particularly I'll be, I like binary and multiple stars and I'll talk eventually about my work where I'm looking at how stars get their spin. Um, I'll divide the talk into three sort of sections. So first I'll have some background, then I'll talk about protostellar multiplicity. This is from a paper that was accepted this year. Um, then I'll talk about how binaries can complicate observations, um, which is uh, looking at some work I did with Jess Jorgensen and also my uh, some master's students that submitted their papers. Um, and then I'll talk about some stuff I'm doing right now about how stars get their spin. Uh, so most of you are astronomers, so I hope you know some basics about multiplicity, but basically a lot of stars exist in binary or multiple star systems. So the x-axis is the mass of uh, a star and the y is the likelihood that it will, or the fraction of those stars that have a companion. So lower mass stars um, are not, have a lower multiplicity, so fewer of them are in multiples, but basically all massive stars have a companion. Um, so yeah, lots of stars are in binaries or multiples. Some people say half the stars, that goes into IMF stuff and it's complicated, but a lot of stars are in binaries. What we also know is that most stars are born in multiple star systems. So um, these are the protostellar classes. So class zero is the very earliest stages of when a star forms. Class one is kind of in between where it's got a disk and then main sequence is where our sun is at. And this again is the multiplicity, or the multiplicity frequency. And for the youngest stars, about two thirds of them have a companion. So a lot of stars are born in multiples. And what we're seeing here is that these young multiple star systems are interacting and disintegrating as they evolve towards the main sequence. And while they are doing that, they host protoplanetary disks, which is the site of planet formation. So, you know, a lot of stars that are single now could have begun in a multiple, um, maybe our sun, I don't know. But if we want to understand planet formation, we probably should understand it in the context of, you know, multiplicity. So protostellar multiplicity. Um, so this was a discovery that came out in 2016. The x-axis is a uh, separation in log space and uh, the y-axis is companion frequency. It's just another measure of multiplicity. And what this found was that there was this bimodal distribution and there was this one peak at about 75 AU and another peak at around 3000 AU. Um, and we're maybe seeing this in other regions. So this is, uh, the, the original observations was in Perseus. Um, these are some observations in Ophiuchus. Maybe we're resolving this first peak, but these error bars are gigantic. And we also don't know what's happening out here. Um, and in Orion, we are also getting this sort of bimodal distribution. Sorry, I should have said that, that the binaries that are being plotted here are class zero, class one, so very young binaries. So when this observation, like when this discovery was first made, um, a neat explanation for this bimodal distribution was that this peak at 3000 AU was due to what we call core fragmentation. So you can have like this big gas cloud that's turbulent and within it, the turbulent motions can make clumps that can form multiple stars. So this happens on kind of hundreds to thousands of AU scales. So that was a nice explanation for this peak here. And the peak at 75 AU was due to what we call disk fragmentation. So this is where you can have a star with a very massive disk that is uh, gravitationally unstable and then it can fragment to form multiple stars. Um, and that could explain this excess at around 75 AU. So that was a very neat explanation. But then when you think about it, there is kind of a couple of problems with this. Um, firstly, the disks that are gravitationally unstable that will form, you know, that will experience disfragmentation are quite rare. Um, I mean, observationally, they wouldn't 
they won't last very long, so it's hard to observe them. We don't see many very like many massive disks that would be gravitationally unstable. But also from simulations, we seem to think that forming these very massive disks is quite difficult. So we didn't think that disk fragmentation produced all of these binaries down here. Another reason is because simulations of core fragmentation, so you have the turbulent cloud and stars forming, often show that these young binaries experience significant in-spiral because when they first form, they are still embedded in their star-forming environment. There's a lot of gas around, a lot of drag. So these systems in-spiral. So, you know, even though systems form out here, they probably can in-spiral to closer separations. Um, so this is what I was investigating in my first postdoc um, at the University of Copenhagen. And the way we did it was that we ran um, six cluster simulations. So I don't have the movie for the lowest mass um, simulation that was 1,500 solar masses, but then we go up to 12,000 solar masses and we had this turbulent box with ideal MHD um, and we sort of just let these simulations run and form stars, so the blue points are all stars. Um, each simulation was run till at least 5% star formation efficiency, so that's 5% of the gas ended up inside the stars. And then I wanted to look at that and compare it with the observations. So what did I do after I had all this star data? I went through it and um, you know, identified every single binary and multiple. So I would just look at the you know, potential energies of the stars and the kinetic energies and find which ones were bound and find the triples and quadruples, so on and so forth. By the way, if anyone has questions, feel free to ask me throughout the talk. But how sensitive is it to the details of the <laughs> yes. So I say we only resolve core fragmentation because of resolution. We don't really resolve disks. Um, the hydro resolution on these is 50 AU. But I mean, it, 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 what happens, what you get out, means on what you put in. So your initial turbulence um, structure, you know, will determine how efficiently it makes stars. So um, the setup starts off with a uniform density and then we have a turbulent field and then we let that run for 20 free fall times before we turn gravity on so yeah okay so statistically we should run sim simulations with different random seeds yes but those are very expensive to run so um we're hoping that because we just let the turbulence drive for a while like we don't we don't drive the turbulence we just put it in the initial field but then it just mixes up things. So we're hoping that the initial conditions are basically wiped out. But, um, but yes, we should run a number of simulations and compare them statistically. Yep, <laughs> definitely. Um, so after I went through this and uh, found all the binaries and multiples, um, I made a plot like this, which summarizes everything. It's very ugly. I'll, I'll walk you through it. So this x-axis is star formation efficiency. So you go from 0% to 5%. And the uh, y-axis is separation for the lowest mass simulation down to the highest mass simulation. And there are these gray lines you can see. I mean, they're overlapping up here, but you can maybe see them up here. Those are the separations of every single bound system that formed. Um, so <laughs> that could either be like you know, two stars in the binary or the tertiary companion to an inner binary or two binaries. Um, but what we see is that, um, it's probably difficult from a distance, but we see that systems in spiral. So sometimes you get like these waves of in spiraling. Sometimes they level off here. Sometimes they keep in spiraling further. Um, some of them in spiral um, faster than others. But yeah, it's what other core fragmentation simulations were showing that these stars can form at larger separations and then in spiral. I also have all these points everywhere. So the points are at the initial separation of a binary and it indicates the formation pathway. Um, so I identified three formation pathways in these simulations. So the first one is what I call bound core fragmentation. It's highlighted by the blue boxes. So you start off with this little cloud, the protostellar core, and you have one star forming and another star forms um, that is bound to the first one, like gravitation at birth. 
then there was unbound core fragmentation. So you can have the system, a star forms, it's technically unbound, but this is the system that it has the lowest energy with respect to, so it's the one it's most bound to. And later on, it actually becomes bound to that system. And then finally, there was dynamical capture. So when a star is born, um, it's not bound to anything, um, but this is the system it's most bound to, but it actually gets captured by something else. So the different colored points, the red, blue, and purple, sort of happen all throughout the simulations. Um, in the paper, I go into statistics of the formation pathways and their in-spiral rates, so you can go have a look at that. But I uh, want to focus on the comparison with the observations. So comparison with observations is complicated because, well, simulations evolve over time and observations are a snapshot in time. So uh, we first had to figure out which simulation to compare with the observations and at what time, so what time slice. Um, so I will try and go through this very quickly. The details are in the paper, but um, Perseus, the, the star forming region we want to compare to, has a, it's about 3,000 solar masses and the volume is, uh, you know, 54-ish parsec cubed and our box was 64 parsec cubed, so not that different. Um, and we had a couple of simulations with masses similar to this. Uh, then we want to, you know, narrow it down further and pick the simulation that produced the same number of visible stars. So what I mean by visible stars is that um, stars that had accretion rates greater than 10 to the minus seven. So that means they were probably young. So class zero, class one. And um, we just, assume that the luminosity was dominated by the accretion luminosity. So the luminosity limits of the Tobin paper was um, greater than 0.1. And they had, they said they could observe up to 120 sol luminosities, but the most luminous object they had was 55 sol luminosities. So we used both of them. Um, and I plotted the number of visible stars, these orange and blue lines, um, over time. So. The dashed line is a number of stars that the Tobin paper had, um, and the black line is a total number of stars in the simulation. And we found that this simulation kind of produced a similar number of visible stars to the Tobin et al. paper, so that would be a good one to compare to. So great, we have a simulation, but what time do we want to compare it to? Um, for other various reasons, I looked at the literature um, from observations and came up with a characteristic star formation efficiency of 4.2%. So we decided, yes, let's look at 4.2% and compare it with the observations. It's a very loaded phrase, compare with observations. A lot of specifics. So yes, there's a lot of different ways we could do this. Um, there's a few different checks that I could use. So, um, you know, the simulations are in three dimensions, but observations are two-dimensional. So maybe I want to project into 2D. That's a good step. Um, a bound check, so I only plot systems that are actually bound in the simulations, but with observations you can't really see or figure out if a system is bound. You're making some assumptions based on how close they are in the sky. And then um, whether I apply the luminosity limits to just try and look at the, the, uh, the young stars. So these are just different configurations of these checks. Um, but 2D bound is the one that's closest to the observations. So what does it look like? Um, so it looks like this. These black uh, histograms are the observations uh, from Perseus. And um, so the, the full three-dimensional data, so all the young stars, all the old stars, um, the distribution just kind of looks a bit flat, maybe. But if you add the luminosity limit, so you're only looking at the class zero, class one stars, you get this peak around 75 AU. Yeah, and maybe there's a valley here, another peak. That was actually kind of surprising. Um, when you project that into two dimensions, yeah, you, the, the peak at larger separations is washed out a bit just because of projection. And yeah, this one looks at unbound companions. You can read about that in the paper. But um, we were very surprised that we kind of sort of got a bimodal distribution and we had a peak at 75 AU. Um, so we wondered if there was a better time to match with. We did a KS test because it's not so concerned about the actual value of the distributions, but the shape. Um, 
So um, we did it for the different luminosity limits, um, so up to 120 solar luminosities of 55. Um, and this black line is a critical value, and if the KS statistic is below that, then it's a pretty good fit. And um, we see that actually the fit varies as the simulation evolves. Um, but the best fit we got was at 4.1%, which is very close to our initial fit. So when we plotted at 4.1%, um, we got an even better fit. Well, yeah, of course, that's what the KS test suggested. But um, yeah, the distribution's kind of whatever when you look at everything. When you only look at the class zero, class one, we get a peak here, and we get a valley, and we get another peak here. Um, when you project into two dimensions, it's, yeah, it's still there. Uh, and we were honestly quite surprised about this because the main thing we want to answer was how many of these closer binaries are formed through core fragmentation, but we're actually getting this bimodal distribution. So if we had disk fragmentation as well, it would just enhance the companion fractions up here. So yeah, we could sort of reproduce the observations. But I said before, we're seeing this feature, the bimodal feature in possibly multiple star forming regions, which might tell you that's a long lived feature. And from our simulations, so this is just the, the 2D bound, um, this is just a movie of how this histogram evolves. You will see that there are waves because systems form further out, but then they in spiral. Um, so it's evolving as you saw with the KS test. And the feature kind of pops up around 3.9%. Nine, there we go. And then it's gone by like 4.3%. So it persists for about 52 kilo years. Um, and I'm not sure uh, how to kind of make sense of this because you know in our simulations, the bimodal distribution was transient, but if we're seeing it in multiple star wing regions, maybe it should be a bit more persistent. Um, yeah, so I'm still trying to make sense of it. I did talk to some observers and they were like, oh well, yeah, all these star forming regions are probably about 4% star formation efficiency. So I don't know, maybe this is something that pops up there. Um, the, the main takeaway is, is that um, systems that form through core fragmentation experience significant in spiral. Um, we could reproduce the bimodal distribution, um, but the main takeaway is that, yeah, a large fraction of close binaries, so less than 100 astronomical units, probably formed through core fragmentation. We're not saying that disfragmentation doesn't happen. It probably does. It's just not making all the binaries with separations less than 100 AU. Um, so that was that paper. And I'll go into the second section. So, um, yes. I had all these big cluster simulations, you know, and one thing we can do with these simulations is we can run zoom in simulations. So if there is a, a system that forms that we're particularly interested in, we can rerun the simulation, but really focusing resolution on that system to look at how, how it formed and how it interacted with, with its environment. Um, so I used zoom in simulations to help some observers make sense of uh, this observation of a protobinary. So these are observations uh, so in different molecules um, of the same object. Uh, this is the primary star of a binary, and this magenta line is where they think a disk should be based on VLA observations. But when they went in with ALMA and tried to measure, measure the radial velocity around this star, you would expect a dipole moment, because you would expect one side of the disk to be coming towards you, being you know, blue shifted and the other side being red shifted as it moves away from you. But what they found was this kind of funky quadrupole moment where you kind of have two red shifted wings and two blue shifted wings, and it was popping up in all the molecules basically that they were observing in. So um, they weren't quite sure how this quadrupole radial velocity was coming to be, but they asked me if maybe something uh, binarity might have something to do with why we see this structure, because this, this is the primary star of uh, a young binary. Um, so I was using my zoom in simulations to try and again compare with observations, which is complicated. 
Like I said before, simulations evolve over time. Observations are a snapshot in time. This is a bit more complicated, though, because radial velocity is dependent on where the observer is. So what we knew about this binary was we think the primary was in the foreground, and the secondary was in the background, and it has a projected separation of 200 AU. So there's an infinite number of vectors along this cone that will produce a projected separation of 200 AU. So I just picked eight of them and tried to make some synthetic observations. I had four zoom-in simulations. Um, I, uh, so this is sort of what the observations show. It has a companion down here. Um, so this is the column density from the simulations, and uh, I just convolved it with a Gaussian beam to sort of make it match better with the observations. This is the radial velocity. I apologize. <laughs> the color bar is not colorblind friendly. But yes, the red, shifted is, uh, the red part is red shifted, blue part is blue shifted. Now the video is going to look a bit disorientating because the projected separation is fixed. But you see, you know, when you have a disk, you have this nice dipole because the disk is spinning like this. But then as the binary sort of interacts with each other and they pass periastron passage, um, the radial velocity signature can start to get pretty messy. Did you have a question? Well, it was a big quick. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I, yeah, it, it's, it's quite quick. Um, so there were... 36 movies, I guess, I made from this. Uh, and what I did was I went through them frame by frame to just sort of find some candidates that popped up with a quadrupole moment. And I gave that to the other authors, and they ranked it. And we kind of decided that these ones on the left were some of the best candidates. Um, so what you have to remember is that, you know, I calculate RV all the way out here, but you really should just like focus around the primary. Um, so this is our better candidates, these are our worst candidates, but at some points in the orbit, you sort of get a quadrupole moment near the primary star. Um, so that was interesting that we could get this, but when do we get it? Does it have something to do with the binarity of the object? So I, I plotted some of the um, characteristics of the binary. Um, so yeah, we had four binaries, B1, 2, and 3, and B1 star was just a high resolution run of B1. And the top, we have separation over orbit number. See, it's orbit number. This is the accretion of the, uh, the system. And uh, this is eccentricity and disk size. But um, yeah. B1 and B3 were lower mass binaries, closer to what we think the observations were. So the observations think it's maybe like one solar mass-ish total. And these were also low mass binaries. B2 happened to actually make a more massive binary. We didn't think it was the best match uh, or best comparison for the observation. But uh, the circles are when we got the matches. So for the low mass binaries, we're kind of getting better matches near periastron, sorry, sorry, near apastron at their widest, and their widest separation was actually about 200 to 300 AU. But for the more massive binary, it, yes, there was one at apastron, but it was also happening at other times. Um, so we're not quite sure why. So <laughs> but, how close do they get in units of the size of the uh, Units of... The size of the protostar. Uh, I mean, from our simulations, they get within tens of AU of each other. But not enough to tidal disrupt. Uh, it would disrupt the disks. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you can see that, uh, especially in the lower mass binaries, that the, uh, the accretion is modulated by the orbit, like you kind of have this... Uh, you know, the accretion is suppressed, but then it's enhanced and suppressed. Um, so this episodic accretion could be playing a role because every time it accretes, it, you know, uh, mass is being dumped from the disk onto the stars and you have an outflow being launched. But yeah, maybe the binary orbit has something to do with why we are seeing these matches near Apastron. Um, so I went back to the movies and really looked at them from all three angles to try and figure out where the different radial velocity contributions were coming from. So this is the velocity field, because you can see that there are accretion streams that are bringing mass onto it, and then there are bridges that can form. Um, and then there is also outflows that are launched 
yeah, that can also produce their own radio velocity signatures. The video goes on for a bit, but you can look at them on my website. But I, I really was like a crime scene investigation to look at these systems from all different angles to figure out what was going on. And um, we have a model. It's a bit messy, so I don't know how good it is, but everyone else was happy with it. Um, but what we see is, yes, we have the primary in the foreground, the secondary in the background, and we think that we're looking at it mostly face on-ish, if we're catching it at Apastron, and this is separation at Apastron is like close to the projected separation. But yeah, so these objects are moving around like this, and um, you know, outflows have been launched when you have an accretion burst, but they're also being dragged along to orbit. Um, so we, saw, we were seeing this in the movies. So you have these outflows being launched probably near periastron and they're being dragged along the orbit. So the outflow lobes are being kind of tilted. Um, but then we also saw that accretion streams were dumping a lot of mass into the system and basically also following the stars. So once an accretion stream is latched onto a star, it will just keep following that star unless like the accretion stream is cut off somehow. So we think that that was also contributing a lot to the radial velocity signature. Yeah, so that was that work. Um, that work actually inspired the work of my master's students. Um, in Denmark, you can do a weird thing where you can have a collaborative thesis. Uh, so I had three master's students um, building on this work. So Vito went into the zoom-in simulations and was measuring their disks and um, how they formed. Uh, Mikael was actually using radiative transfer to produce uh, synthetic observations, unlike what I did, which was just comparing the density from the simulation to the observations. And then Rami was using machine learning to match the observations with the synthetic images, unlike what I did by eye. So they submitted their papers and we have their referee reports back and we have to resubmit them. But one of the results I found quite interesting um, was this, so I'll explain it. You have uh, the primary, secondary, and orbit. And these are different uh, viewing angles. So face on means it's a viewing angle of the primary's disk. So if you have the primary with its disk and you're looking over here, uh, face on to the secondary's disk and face on to the orbit. And then you had sort of two edge on vectors. And um, what this is plotting is, so time zero uh, moving up, is the uh, bolometric temperature. Uh, so the bolometric temperature is often used to sort of classify the evolutionary stage of these young stars. Um, and yeah, there are these dividers. So there's this red line here. This is a divider between class zero and class one. And if you have a higher bolometric temperature, then you can also have this divider between class one and class two. So basically, the, uh, the colder the bolometric temperature, the more like early, the earlier the evolutionary stage is. Um, and the blue points kind of say are at uh, periastron, the yellow points are at apastron. So if you see a little stripe between blue and yellow, that's one orbit. And what we see is that for when you're looking at the system more face on, um, the classification of the star can change quite dramatically depending on when you're looking at it. Because it can go anywhere from a class zero to where it's very embedded to a class two. Um, and that's probably because because of the binary orbit. So when they're going near periastron, the disk is being disrupted, it's more exposed, but then at apastron, the disk is being built up again, they become more embedded. Um, so this is happening over the course of an orbit. This is for the massive binary that was there. When you look at the edge on sides, it's not varying as much. The secondary varies a bit more, probably because it's lower mass and it's being affected a lot more, but there is some variation happening here. For the lower mass binaries, um, so this one is showing some large scale variations um, over multiple orbits. And that's just probably because the environment around the star is changing quite a lot. There could be an accretion stream that's sort of getting in the way of these viewing angles. That's really making them look more obscured than it's disappearing. And you can see it a lot more. And um, yeah, again, you just see variation. So the main takeaway was that, um, yeah, we, we could not replicate the radial velocity signature without taking into account accretion streams from the larger environment. And basically, binarity 
can complicate observations. Uh, it depends on where you're looking at it and when you're looking at it because this evolutionary state of an object can change quite significantly over the course of an orbit. Any questions before I go on the last part? So basically, what, have we figured out sort of what's going on with him? Why you get this type of pulse emission? Yeah, so the quadrupole was like, yeah. So, but so I'm just, I saw that, but can you sort of tell us where are we seeing that? Um, yeah, so I think what we're saying, seeing is that the disk contribution isn't significant and it's mostly just like the outflow lobes being dragged along and these accretion streams. But why, if you've got outflows, you know, jets this way, that way, yeah. why do you see quadrupole? Um, the, you know, that, that yeah, that's why we've also paired it with these accretion streams that were following the stars. So um, that's, again, sensitive to the environment because like maybe there isn't an accretion stream coming from this direction. But um, in our movies, it looked like accretion streams were contributing a lot to the radio velocity signature. That's why I'm like, I don't know how I feel about this model. The other authors were okay with the model. Oh, no, I'm not going is the claim that the system spends 100% of its time in a state like this, or can you quantify what fraction of its time it spend? I mean, I think we'll, what we'll find the matches at Apastron. So it probably is, maybe we see this more at when it's further apart than when it's near Periastron. Um, and yeah, we just might have happened to observe the system at Apastron, but that makes sense for binaries. You're more likely to catch them when they're at Apastron because they have to spend more time there than at Perry Um But this binary is, yeah, like I said, projected separation of 200 AU, its orbital period is probably quite large. So I don't think we'll be able to catch it at any other point in, um, in the orbit. Um, yeah, should I go on to the last stage? Okay, I will. So this is some stuff I'm doing right now. I will warn you it's very preliminary but I'm looking at protostellar spin. So stellar spin, what we know, um, so this is the um, big sign I, so I guess the velocity on the surface or how far they spin. Basically it measures spin uh, for, and this is the, uh, the spectral type. Uh, and what we see is that lower mass stars generally have a spin slower than high mass stars and that's because of the craft break when the, uh, the star kind of goes from a convective core to a radiative core. But yeah, massive stars spin quite fast, low mass stars, not really. And um, what we expect with uh, low mass stars is after the first phases of star formation, you know, when they accrete, after they lose the disk, we expect the star to kind of keep contracting slowly, but also to keep spinning down because of um, winds that come from the star. So, yeah. Um, so Marina Conkle was looking at um, stars and tests um, from quite young, so a few million years to like 100, a giga year, I think it was. Yes. Uh, looking at their angular momentum. So L, in this case, is angular momentum. And this is just the effect of temperature. And what you see when you look at the, you know, the oldest, the youngest stars, and you go to the oldest stars, you get this nice gradient where stars, you know, they have a higher angular momentum, but then they spin down very slowly uh, over the course of their life. But this was ignoring um, some, uh, a class of stars that she found called fast rotators. So these were all single stars. The fast rotators were um, stars that had rotation periods of two days or less. And she did some fitting to figure out the likelihood of them being a binary or a single star. So the main sequence was a single star, the binary sequence was a binary star. And what they were finding was that these fast rotators were seemed to overwhelmingly be binary stars with a companion that's a tens of AU away. And she asked us whether um, the fact that they are binaries has something to do with why they're fast rotators. So a few mechanisms about um, yeah, angular momentum evolution in disks. So when you have a young star, you have this disk, and um, protostars can lose a lot of angular momentum because there's disk locking, which forces the, the star to rotate at the same rate as the inner disk. So then it has to slow down, and then angular momentum is being lost through, through jets and outflows. 
Um, but then, yeah, after the disc is dispersed, you have magnetic braking that will slow them down some more. Um, this is a model that we have. Uh, we tested it observationally a little bit, I guess. So Santa at L was looking at um, spin of stars from very young ages to yeah, 20,000, uh, let's say 20 million years. These blue points are all just different stars. Um, and they were trying to fit it to two different models. Um, so the yellow line was a model of a star's spin assuming that there was no disk uh, ever, so the, the, the star would just sort of keep contracting and conserve its angular momentum and the spin would just increase. Uh, and then there was model A, which assumes the presence of a disk continuously. So the disk is always there and it's always siphoning off angular momentum and then it's just going to keep, um, yeah, level off at some point. Now, um, we don't expect disks to last until 20 million years, we actually think most of these disks are gone around 5 million years. Um, so when they tried to fit these blue points with different mass spins, what they kind of saw was that, yes, you have these stars spin down in the first few million years, but then they spin up a little bit. That's probably this further contraction after the disk is gone. So yeah, this model seems to work, but how does the presence of a companion change this? Um, so what I do is I've been running some simulations with Flash because um, uh, Flash has this nice sync particle module, which I'll just throw up a picture here. You can have this clump of gas and if it's collapsing, it can be replaced by a, a sync particle and they can just sort of orbit on the merry way. This is just an, an example. But this sync particle, sync particle module uh, approximates how much uh, spin it's accreting. Um, to my understanding, at least with Ramsey's, which is the crew I was using before, doesn't do that. And I'm pretty sure lots of other sync particle modules just don't try and approximate the spin, but Flash does. And it was designed for another purpose, but I realized you could use it for this. Um, so I start off with these simulations of um, a spherical cloud. So just a very ideal, so nice spherical cloud. It's got a uniform density and it's got different levels of turbulence. So I test with no turbulence on the top row and I test with uh, some turbulence and even higher turbulence up here. And I also tested different initial spins to these clouds. This had uh, no, well, low spin to higher spin. And these movies are gonna show like a top-down view of uh, the disc. So I have these simulations running. I tried to run them for a few thousand years and we have the primary star forming in the middle, but then you sometimes have uh, other companions forming and then they interact with each other and um, yeah, affect how, they, how the stars grow. I will tell you that we definitely have way too much fragmentation because we don't have radiation. This is ideal MHD. Um, so if we had radiation, we would have less fragmentation, but um, nevertheless, we still went into these and looked at how the, the spin of the system of the stars evolved. So um, first I'll start off with the mass evolution. This is no turbulence. This is more turbulence. Um, blue is low initial cloud spin and red is high initial cloud spin. And um, the solid lines are for each of the stars and the transparent line is the total mass of the system. So what you see is that the primary star kind of forms, it grows very quickly, then it sort of levels off, but then sometimes you have these little bursts of accretion where the primary star grows a bit more. Um, that also happens in some of these other cases. So the primary star grows and then slows down, but then grows some more. So when these um, sort of growth periods happen, it's happening around the same time as uh, fragmentation because these are new stars that are forming from the, the disk fragmentation. So. Yeah, you have. We've got different Mach numbers there, so can we say something about that? Oh, that was for the initial conditions of the simulation. So the simulation starts with a spherical cloud, uniform density, um, and it's got a rotation. But then on top of that solid body rotation, there's a turbulent velocity field. Yeah, that's really what I was yeah. referring to at the beginning. You can have different yeah. turbulence. Yeah. Oh, yes? Mass is only going up to 0.6, so you're not getting the tensor solar mass. 
Well, we are also limited by the mass reservoir, so our clouds are only a solar mass. So these are going to be forming low mass binaries. Yep. <laughs> um, so that was the, the mass growth. And let's look at the angular momentum, so this, the spin of the stars. So again, you know, you have the primary star forming and it spins up, but then it sort of levels off a bit. But then it has these spin up events that happen um, again. So this is another case, you have these spin up events happening. And they all, again, are triggered when you have the fragmentation. So if we're looking at angular momentum and mass, and they're following the same profile, maybe we should look at the specific angular momentum. So if we look at the specific angular momentum, mass specific angular momentum, um, similar story. So for all yeah, intents and purposes, the specific angular momentum actually is a more direct measure of the spin. Um, I keep saying the particles are stars. The particles are not stars. The particles are tracing the star and the inner disk. So we will have to make some assumptions of how much of the mass of the particle is actually in the star and how much angular momentum of the particle is in the star. But basically, this page, the specific angular momentum, is tracing the spin of the star and inner disk. So you see that it spins up and it levels off, but then sometimes you have these spin up events later on. Um, again, yeah, these spin up events are happening when you have fragmentation. Um, so I'm trying to figure out what exactly with these fragmentation events causes a spin up. Sorry. Um, uh, so this is just zooming in on one of the interesting parts of, of the simulation. So you have this, uh, this is all the same simulation. This is looking at density. Um, it's got the primary star in the middle. This is looking at the angular momentum with the primary star in the middle. And what you'll see is that the angular momentum basically follows the density. Yes, sir? So you mentioned that the spin-up events, are, does, does that line up with the fragmentation is also happening? Yeah. Do you actually expect this to happen with radiation turned off? I don't know if it would change the angular momentum transport. I think the radiation would just mostly change a fragmentation, like the number of particles we'll have forming. Um, but I'm not sure if radiation would change the angular momentum transport. Hmm. I'll have to read about that a bit more. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is density and angular momentum, but this is a specific angular momentum. Um, and I have these contours just kind of tracing different um, a specific angular momentum levels, so you have high angular momentum material and it gets lower and lower as it goes closer to the primary. And um, what I'm finding is that, yeah, you have these spiral arms that are being triggered by the companion like fragmentation and it's kind of transporting high angular momentum material inwards. But when you look at the specific angular momentum movie, like that doesn't, the distribution doesn't, doesn't change very much. Ah. Um, so I'm still trying to figure out, okay, I can see this high angular momentum material going into the middle, but why is the star spinning up? Um, it is also very difficult to see from these projections what exactly, like how exactly the sink is responding to what's going around it. But I'm still trying to figure it out. So um, yeah, again, very preliminary plots. <laughs> um, so I made a disk uh, volume just around the primary star radius. 20 AU, and I, within this disk, I was just measuring what the angular momentum and specific angular momentum of the gas is. So um, this is for, yeah, this wasn't very well plotted. This is the low spin simulations, the high spin simulations with different mark. So blue is no mark and green is high mark. And you see for the angular momentum, at least within the inner disk, um, you get these, it's varying quite a bit, especially the gray lines is when where the nearest companion is. When you have a companion forming, you have the angular momentum kind of in the inner disk also responding to that and growing. Um, so in this case, you have a companion forming and then the, the angular momentum and the inner disk increases. So it looks like, yeah, when you measure the angular momentum, it's responding to the formation of a companion. But when you look at the specific angular momentum profile, it just looks pretty steady. And I can't figure out why. And I'm just trying to really understand where my stars are getting their spin from. So. Uh, this is stuff I'm still working on, but basically when you get fragmentation in these disks, you get these spin-up events. So maybe 
that could lead to these fast rotators that we're observing, or it could at least contribute to that. Um, yeah, so that's the, the main takeaway that I have right now. This is work in progress, and I'll leave it there. So I think I'm a little bit confused about this last one, because usually when you material coming in through a disk, you'd expect it has capillary and angular momentum, so you always have an overabundance of angular momentum. And the question is, usually in star formation, how do you get rid of the angular momentum? And so the question I think you would want to ask is, why is this getting rid of angular momentum different in the binary system compared to the single star system? It's not how you get what it in the first place. Well, Yes, you have to lose angular momentum to get material in a disk to be accreted. But when you actually think about the star and the stuff that's falling onto the star, a star can accrete a, a packet of gas with any angular momentum up until the breakup speed. So it can. There is a, a large range of angular momentums that the material uh, that, that the star can accrete. So I guess maybe in the single star cases, it's accreting more of this low angular momentum material. But in these binary cases it's creating higher angular momentum material. It's not so high that it's beyond the breakup speed, it's just higher. Okay, so why is more the coupling of the, of the star to the disk that they're, but they're the coupling that breaks these stars down? And so in a binary system, you may be distorting this disk and therefore disrupting the process that, that allows the stars to get rid of it. Oh, definitely. That could also be playing a role. Like, you know, the models kind of show that disks are important for losing angular momentum. But if you're in a binary, these disks are truncated and probably can disappear faster. So that means like the, the time scale for spinning down due to disks is truncated in binaries. Um, so that probably does also play a role. Yeah. Yep, yeah. So, all, so many things I can be doing with all this data. <laughs> yep. Can I ask you about your master's students? And yep, I think it's a really nice idea of looking at that doing that over the years, having them collaborate. You've got them each on a different part of the project yep. so that they, they each got to pull their weight. And yep. did you find they did? How did, how did you? How did... Um, yeah, so uh, they we got them at the same time. And um, so I was officially co-supervising them. I also had Charles and we had this problem. We sort of identified three different sections to help them out. I will say that like, Two of them had a more obvious project and one of them not so obvious and I kind of had to really help him figure out what exactly his role is. But um, there was a general pipeline that, you know, the, the radio transfer synthetic images and the, the quantitative measurements of disk and stuff that was the metadata, those will both feed into the machine learning pipeline. And it was actually quite nice because they worked together about, you know, what kind of outputs do I need to produce to, for the inputs of the machine learning and um, it was a really interesting experience. So you, you want to make sure that they're, they're competent in each. I mean, like if you gave one of them a whole lot of maths, <laughs> they, they'd stop me. Well, they approached us with their interests and we worked with that. Okay. Yeah, and if you've got a slacker in there, then the others, you know, that's, it's always a problem. Thankfully, none of them seemed to slack off. You know, it was their masters writing on it and it was a small enough team that, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, but the, the general, you know, general work is uh, really interesting because there's so much to do, isn't there? There is, and I now understand the appeal of having students because there's lots of interesting questions that I have. <laughs> it would be good to give them to students. Yeah. Any other? Yeah. I have a question from like earlier on with the disk and core fragmentation. Yeah. So when you had like the um, the plot where it showed like the frequency of like the separation, uh, was it one of like the two, the bimodal peaks? Yep. When you compared the um, yours to observations. Oh yeah. So let me go to this plot. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. So based on the observations, how like what fraction of these of the the um the closer peak? Do you expect to originate from the disk and what fraction do you expect to originate from the... So that's what we were hoping to answer, actually, because we, we thought that we'll get like a, a flat-ish distribution here and then we could just be like, okay, any excess is due to disk fragmentation. But from our simulation, it looks like maybe not many 
are due to disc fragmentation? Because if you had disc fragmentation, yeah, you would enhance like the companions, the companion frequency at the, the much smaller separations. But like, yeah, we get this bimodal distribution. If it was just sort of flat, we'd be like, okay, yes, you get a bunch of stars a bunch of binaries at closer separations forming through core fragmentation in spiral, and then you need more disfragmentation to create this uh, overdensity at, at 75 AU. But um, but we we didn't, which was a little concerning. But yes, or oh, not concerning, just surprising. Yeah. Any others? Other questions? So I sort of have talked about your um, binary thing. Um, just um, you know, just sort of speculating. But um, what would happen if you added a planet shear simulation? Um, could a planet explain some of the behavior? Maybe. So in our high resolution simulation, we only get down to 0.8 AU. Um, the standard resolution for these was 2 AU, like a bit under 2 AU. So like if there's a planet that's, you know, much closer in. Could be, we're just not resolving that. I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. Hate to be this archetype. Um, what about magnetic fields? And just, um, so, so do you have all of them are ideal MHD? All of it, all the both, all the simulations have ideal MHD. All of them are ideal MHD. Yeah. So we don't have non ideal effects, which also could complicate things, but yeah. Um, yeah, definitely if we're doing disk simulations and maybe we should think about the non-ideal effects, but yeah. So what's what's your prescription for the magnetic fields of the stars themselves? They're, 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 the stars don't have a magnetic field. Yeah. The stars don't have a magnetic field. Okay. No, that's not blue. <laughs> yeah. I mean, stars spin down because of magnetic braking, you know. Yes, yeah, so our Spin, our protostyle spin simulations are only running for a few thousand years after um, their formation. Uh, so yes, definitely, you know, after a few million years, they're spinning down, but that's not what we're modeling here. We're just kind of looking at the angular momentum budget in the, the star and in the disk system, like area. Yeah, and hopefully we can learn something about how stars spin up. It's, but definitely, yes, later on, you need magnetic fields inside the star. So there are other groups that are actually simulating stars with magnetic fields. But we are more, con to us, stars are point sources. Uh, but you're after their speed. Yes, yeah, we are. Um, this, is the thing, this is where it's complicated. Yeah, because a star itself, you know, it has it's a few solar radii. Like, well, one to two solar radii for a pretty star. Right, uh, but our simulations are, the resolution is on AU scales. So yeah, well, we're just, they're two different, they're two different scales. So for our work, that's why the stars are point sources. But we are still hoping to learn again about how the stars are accreting and the environment nearest to the star. Yeah, that's, what, that's why we have to make a lot of assumptions about how much of the sink particle mass is actually in the star, how much of the sink particle angular momentum is actually in the star. So these are, these are assumptions that we do have to make, and they are definitely caveats. Yeah, and we have to be careful about how we approach it. Okay. So at this scale that you're looking at, the actual, the large scale field of the stars is still too small compared to the overall. Yeah. Okay. What kind of magnetic field strengths do you get in these sorts of regions? Interactions, like what? I haven't actually measured. I do have that data. I just never looked at it. Um, I mean, with the zoom-ins, you do see, and even on the other simulations, you, you do see the spin-up, uh, the, the winding up of the magnetic field, and we get self-consistent jets forming. So you do, we do get, we do simulate that magnetic field amplification. Um, I just haven't measured it. That's all. How does that compare with what we've observed? Observations of. Uh, haven't really compared outflows with observations, but they look quite reasonable. They don't have any odd behavior. So yeah, but that could be another project for someone to do.